So the desert foot, which is what you're going to hear me say multiple times, is exactly what it sounds like, a foot that's dry, no blood. There's, there's nothing there. There's no microvasculature. There's nothing to bypass to. There's nothing to angioplasty. How do you save a foot like that? And this is what this talk is about. So I will go on here. I have no disclosures. Um, so this is kind of what I'm gonna outline today. I'm gonna to spend a lot of time on what constitutes the no option patient because that was the mistake in the eighties. People didn't know who this technology was for. And so it was just sort of a free for all for any patient that you would wanna give an amputation to and the outcomes were not ideal. And so as a result, this went to the wayside as I mentioned. And so picking the right patient in order to have success is fundamental, just like with anything that we do. But in this case, even extra because there isn't a, a payment, so to speak, that the patient and the surgeon or the interventionalist has to make in order to make this successful over the course of months. And so if you pick the wrong patient and then you have a negative outcome, it can be um, um, very demoralizing. After we talk about that, I'm going to talk about the three types of deep venous arterialization. There's the open procedure, which is purely surgical, the percutaneous, which is per, uh, purely endovascular, and then the hybrid, which is um, exactly that, a hybrid between open and endo, and probably the most likely thing that you see currently, um, but down the pike is coming uh, purely a percutaneous approach. And finally, I'll spend a little bit of time on outcomes of these three approaches and what to expect when you operate on these patients. So to start with, I want to start at the bare bones. When you say deep venous arterialization, people have no idea what is going on. That was myself included. Um, I was really introduced to this topic by Dr. Ferrarisi, who's um, a guy out of Italy, um, one of the interventionalists who's phenomenal, written a lot on this topic. And I went and did a little mini fellowship with him. And a lot of these slides are, are his, which I'll give credit to him later. But um, it really is something that's difficult to conceptualize. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time on that. So to start with, Deep venous arterialization is simply shunting blood into the deep veins to arterialize them. The classic deep venous arterialization that we do is when we make fistulas. We arterialize the veins, whether they be superficial or deep. And that's exactly what you're doing in this case. You're just making a super duper fistula to allow for arterial blood flow to go into the veins. But unlike in fistula surgery, where you're trying to make an arterial venous connection to do dialysis because you just want blood blood that's arterialized to flow through the machine. In this case, what you're doing is you're arterializing the vein in order for the vein to actually become a pseudo artery and deliver blood to the tissue that has no more arterial microvasculature or macrovasculature in that area. So there is a little bit of a history to this. The first AV anastomosis was really described in 1881. And then beyond that, uh, actually the first deep venous arterialization was performed in 1894 and ended very badly. The patient ended up getting CHF, the fistula went, you know, was too good and the patient ultimately died. And then it wasn't until the 70s, 80s, as I uh, described the, uh, that Dr. Scheel really talked about kind of what we think of today as the DVA procedure. It was kind of all the craze um, and really what it was is taking a venous venous conduit, um, specifically GSV, and trying to get arterial blood flow to the foot. Um, it did work in a very small subset of patients, but again, um, the outcomes long-term ultimately were amputation, and so it wasn't worth all the effort, and it went to the wayside. Um, there's a little bit of physiological support for DVA in animal models, essentially just the physiological idea that you can put arterial blood into the venous system, and then the venous system can deliver that arterial blood to the cells. That concept has been proven. And really the way that they did that is they pretty much looked at tissue oxygenation and then um, neo-revascularization of tissues once you do deep venous arterialization and did find that in these tissues that initially had nothing or were desert-like, once the blood was arterialized through the veins, indeed you had new blood vessels sprout and you had an increase in the oxygenation to that tissue. So now, once we accept that deep venous arterialization does work in the physiological and in the, in the theoretical sense, now the big question is, who should we do, be doing it to? And as I mentioned, this is really fundamental, so I'll spend some time on what's the perfect candidate. So there's two words, acronyms, really, that I want to bring to your attention that everybody kind of discusses. It's in the lingo of deep venous arterialization or DVA, and that is SAD disease 
these. And this was coined again by Dr. Ferrarisi, the Italian um, uh, interventionalist I discussed, who was one of my mentors. He um, uh, talked about SAD disease being essentially the microvascular disease where the small vessels have arterial disease and the bad disease are the quote big vessels like the, the actual named vessels of the leg that have disease. So in sad transmission and bad transmission, essentially what we're talking about is what type of arterial disease you have. Is it small or big vessel disease? So this is an example of bad disease. So as you can see, the big vessels here light up, you know, you got your SFA, you've got some tibial disease here, but as you move down, you have reconstitution of something you could potentially go after to get inflow all the way to the leg via the big vessels. So there's disease in the tibials, but not necessarily in the mic microvasculature. This is another, uh, just a screenshot essentially of, of quote, bad disease. Again, you can see, of course you have tibial disease, but look, there's something that you could get into and you could potentially hit this as your target and get inflow um, in this person's leg. If once you do that, and then you shoot an angio, wow, you know, beautiful. You've got flow everywhere. So this is a person that had big vessel disease. This person is not a candidate for deep venous arterialization, not a candidate. In fact, if you were to operate on a person like that, you would be hurting them. You'd ultimately cause them to have a uh, uh, amputation unnecessarily. So now let's talk about sad disease. So again, the vessels here look okay. Your big vessels too, they look okay, but really you have not much in the foot, and that's really the, the point. So again, once you revascularized, look at this, nothing in the toes as compared to the previous one I showed you. So this is sad disease or small vessel disease. So let's say you had a, a wound down on this toe, that's never gonna heal, right? Because you may have reconstituted to the foot, but maybe this person might get away with a TMA, probably not, right? So again, bad disease where the big vessels are impacted, and sad disease where the small vessels are impacted and your money patients are here, okay? This is what deep venous arterialization is for. It is for the quote, desert foot. Again, nothing in the foot, no blood supply, it's completely dry. And this is a person that I'm gonna have a conversation with about amputation or a person that we're gonna try to kind of whittle away and they're gonna end up with like eight months of a you know, foot that just won't heal, won't heal, won't heal. And now you're doing a baloney amputation, okay? Bad disease, not a candidate. Sad disease, excellent candidate.